Okay, let's start. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, and today we are happy to have Linus Wolf and he will speak uh, on ODD and string alpha prime corrections. Uh, so please start. Okay, thank you, Dimitri. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to uh, give this seminar. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is based on, uh, on this paper that appeared uh, about two months ago together with my students. Uh, So let me start off with some uh, words of, of introduction, just to make sure we're all on the same page. So if you start from, uh, from Einstein gravity in D dimensions, uh, capital D, and then you reduce it on as a D dimensional torus with uh, uh, lowercase d, uh, then, uh, or equivalently, or more or less equivalently, if you assume that the metric is independent of, uh, of D of the coordinates, which I call YM. So uh, where M runs from capital D minus lowercase d to capital D minus one, uh, then you get a, a GLD uh, symmetry from the internal diffeomorphisms. So uh, basically you can, you can still transform these coordinates uh, by some GLD matrix in this way. Uh, and so the, the reduced, the theory reduced uh, on the on the d-dimensional torus a has this GLD symmetry from the diffeomorphisms in the internal directions. Uh, but what I'm interested in is string theory. But at low energies, string theory is described also by Einstein gravity uh, together with a couple of other fields. So there's a two-form potential uh, B M N, and there's a scalar field known as the dilaton phi, and the action uh, the, the two derivative action takes this form. So it depends on G, B, and phi. Uh, there's an overall uh, factor of the dilaton. And there's the Einstein, the usual uh, Ritchie scalar of the Einstein theory. There's a kinetic term for the dilaton and a kinetic term for the B field. So H is the field strength uh, of this B field. And, uh, for the bosonic string, the dimension here, D, would be 26, which is the critical dimension for the bosonic string. Or uh, we can also think of this as being a sector part of the superstring theory, in which case D is uh, 10. And in that case, this describes just some of the fields and there are additional fields, which I won't be talking about here. So this is an SNS sector, if you want, of the superstring, or if you want just the low energy effective action for the bosonic string. Uh, but what happens for this theory is that if you reduce it now on a d-dimensional torus, then you get not just the GLD symmetry, but you get an enhanced uh, symmetry, an ODD, um, OD comma D symmetry, uh, where D is the dimension that you reduced on, so the number of uh, coordinates that the metric is independent on. And this is larger, this ODD doesn't fit inside GLD, it's larger, so there's an enhancement of symmetry. Uh, in fact, this symmetry is there. The symmetry was first discussed by Meissner and Rumiziano, and then it was shown to be there also when you include uh, the additional terms present here, which are uh, which come with powers of the inverse uh, string tension, uh, which is conventionally called alpha prime. So there's an infinite series of alpha prime corrections uh, in string theory, but these also respect this enhanced ODD symmetry. Uh, when you dimensionally reduce the theory. Uh, but this enhancement of the symmetry actually arises from a, a particular property of string theory, which is known as t-duality. Uh, and it's far from manifest. So if you just take this, uh, this Lagrangian action and you reduce it, you won't see the symmetry. You have to do some work to see the symmetry. But uh, so the question is, could you make it manifest now? And one idea to make it manifest is if you could formulate the theory to start with, the theory in, D to, in capital D dimensions, uh, such that it has an ODD symmetry, where D is now the critical dimension, the dimension you started from, so 26 for the bosonic string or 10 for the superstring. Uh, if you could have a theory with that symmetry, then when you reduced it on a D-dimensional torus, then this uh, ODD 
uh, but the big D would just reduce to the ODD of the small D, and this would make this uh, this symmetry manifest. And the idea of formulating the string effective action uh, with this uh, bigger ODD symmetry already before you dimensionally reduce uh, goes under the name of double field theory, DFT. Uh, so th this goes back to work by Siegel in 93, and then uh, more recently worked by Holm, Hollins, Feebach in particular. Uh, but even before that, there were closely related ideas uh, by Duff and Seiflin, uh, papers from 1990. Now, the name double field theory derives from the fact that it, it turns out that this ODD must act on the coordinates themselves. Uh, and for that reason, you have to double the coordinates. You have to go from the from the usual uh, d-dimensional coordinates x m to some bigger capital X capital M, which is twice as many coordinates. Uh, so we introduce an extra set of d coordinates, which are called x tilde. Okay, so giving d plus d or two d coordinates. Uh, and this is because this x has to transform under ODD. So uh, now it can transform as an ODD vector in this way uh, with some ODD matrix O, uh, which by definition preserves the, the metric. And it's uh, D comma D, so it's a split signature metric. Uh, but I can write it in this uh, off diagonal way as that once off the diagonal, basically. So this is the, the ODD metric any ODD transformation uh, O preserves. Okay, so these bigger coordinates now transform nicely under ODD. But we wanted to describe a D-dimensional theory, not a 2D-dimensional theory. Uh, and to fix this, we need to impose an ODD invariant constraint, uh, which halves the dimension again. So we started by doubling the dimension, and now we have to uh, divide the dimension by two again, but we have to do it in such a way that we, uh, this constraint preserves the ODD invariance. And, and uh, the way to do this is what's usually called the section condition or sometimes the strong constraint. Uh, and the idea is you impose the following constraints of phi one and phi two are any, any fields or any uh, combination product of fields in the theory. Uh, if you impose that when you have two contracted derivatives, could also act on the same field, but uh, in general, it would act on different fields. Uh, whenever you have two contracted derivatives, and the contraction here is with the ODD metric, beta and minus, you require that to be zero. Now, if you write this out, because this metric is off diagonal, uh, it couples the usual derivative with respect to the coordinates x uh, to the derivative with respect to the other set of coordinates, the tilde, uh, the x tilde coordinates. Okay, in this way, and then this uh, it's symmetric uh, between one and two. Uh, and then you see directly from that that you can take you can solve this constraint by letting all fields depend only on the field on the coordinates x. Okay, uh, and so you're back to a d-dimensional situation. So you drop all the dependence on the tilde coordinates. Clearly, this solves. Uh, this uh, condition because uh, derivatives with respect to the tilde coordinates are set to zero. Okay, this is the standard solution of this constraint and we will assume this uh, solution throughout this talk. Um, but it's important to note that a priori such an ODD invariant formulation is not guaranteed to exist, okay? Uh, you might hope that it exists, but there's no guarantee that it's going to exist. But in fact, it turns out that at the lowest order in alpha prime, so if you neglect the higher derivative alpha prime corrections, then you can write the string effective action, the action that I wrote before on the first slide, in an ODD invariant form. And uh, the traditional way to do that is to introduce a generalized metric, uh, this curly H, which involves the, the metric and the B field in this interesting combination, and also a generalized dilaton, uh, which is called D, which is defined so that e to the minus two D is uh, e to the minus two phi times uh, the square root of the determinant of the metric. Okay, so you can rewrite 
I'll go back to right. You can rewrite this action uh, for the metric B field and dilaton just in terms of these new fields, uh, the generalized metric and the generalized dilaton in such a way that it's invariant under ODD transformations. So for the bosonic string, it would be O26, O26, a very large symmetry. Linus, may I ask a question? Yes. So Sorry, I got lost right away. Uh, so, so you have capital D and you have small d. Yes. Could you, could you please remind what is the difference? Capital D is the critical dimension of the string that I'm interested in. So it's 26 or 10, depending on if you're talking about the bosonic string or the superstring. So capital D, so if you want, you can always set capital D to 26 or 10 if you prefer to talk about the superstring. Okay? And small d? Small d is uh, the number of dimensions that I'm reducing on, okay? So if I do a dimensional reduction of d dimensions, uh, that's the lowercase d. Okay? Yep. The, lower, the lowercase d is not going to appear uh, pretty much for the rest of the talk. We'll be interested in this, uh, uh, this ODD with the capital D. May, may I ask the following question? I'm, I'm just confused. I'm, I don't, do not know if my question makes any sense. I just got lost right away. Uh, what do you do seems very similar to toroidal compactification. And in that yeah. case, you, you have a world sheet CFT, which as right. you mentioned has T dualities, yeah. but the group of T dualities is uh, not just O D comma D, it's O D comma D comma Z. It's an uh, integer valued matrices. Yeah. So for the full quantum theory, it's you only have the this discrete version of ODD. Here I'm talking mm -hmm. about just uh, tree-level string theory. Uh, so the massless low and the, the low energy effective action for the massless fields to order all orders in alpha prime, but only tree-level in the string coupling. So I, I should say that here. I, I will only talk about uh, I will ignore quantum corrections in the string theory. So string loop corrections are not included here. I'm only talking about uh, classical uh, string theory, tree-level, tree-level effective action for string theory. In which case you have an ODDR symmetry. But in what sense? Shown by it, in, yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with those works and I, I don't want to hold your presentation. Uh, I just try to understand the basic thing. Uh, sure. in, in case of this toroidal compactification story, uh, mm -hmm. if you start applying OD, D, it moves one. Tor torus to another torus, which changes the physical spectrum of the CFT. So mm -hmm. it's it's not a symmetry. It, it it's a transformation which moves a, a critical string to a critical string. Yes. In what sense this is a symmetry in your case? Uh, here, as I said, I'm, I'm only talking at the level of the low energy effective action. If you include, if you uh, drop all the G string corrections. You only include the alpha prime corrections. Then the statement is that the low energy effective action should have an ODDR symmetry when you reduce it on a d-dimensional torus. Can I can I try to bridge the gap? Uh, sure. So here we are looking just at massless modes, and ODD maps them into themselves. We're not talking about massive string modes. Indeed, so the spectrum will be not the same, but uh, it's just the low energy effective action. This is one point. Second point is that uh, uh, what Linz is talking about, the, so there's no isometries assumptions, assumption now. So you just assume there are no isometries, generic background, but you double the coordinates formally. So it's like looking at phase space formulation where you have X and P and you formally try to see how far you can get with that. Yes, for this double field theory, O oh, capital D, capital D. Yeah, it's not guaranteed to be to make any sense, but one could try to do that and see what will happen. Yeah, precisely. Yes, I think I, I understand. Thank you. Yeah. So, so this is the game we're playing here. So as I said here, this is not guaranteed to to exist this formulation, but it turns out it exists at, at the lowest order in alpha prime. Okay, and this is somewhat surprising because it's more symmetry that you, than you would expect to have. But on the other hand, you know that you should have, when you reduce on D dimensions, you should have an, uh, a lowercase D dimension 
you should have the ODB symmetry. And that's very, very constraining. And you might expect that there is some trace of this fact already in D dimensions. Okay, so that, that might be an explanation for why you can see this larger symmetry in, uh, already in, in 10 or 26 dimensions. Uh, now, this, this formulation, uh, this, uh, this double field theory formulation has proved very useful for many purposes. Uh, in particular, it's been used to, to find consistent truncations in supergravity, and uh, it's useful also for discussing generalizations of t-duality, like plus only t-duality. And there are many, many more uses of double field theory. But what I'll be interested in here is uh, higher derivative corrections. So we know that string theory also has these alpha prime corrections. Uh, and so the action, so again, I'm talking about the tree level effective action for the string. So I'm setting the string coupling to zero. Uh, and then the low energy effective action for the massless fields uh, takes this form where the Lagrangian has an expansion in alpha prime. And the first couple of corrections uh, are uh, pretty well known, their explicit form. Particularly, the first correction at order alpha prime is present for the bosonic and the heterotic string. And it involves the Riemann tensor squared plus some other terms, which I won't uh, talk too much about. They involve the, the field strength of B, H. Uh, the next correction at alpha prime squared uh, for the bosonic string involves a Riemann cubed uh, 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 plus other things. For the heterotic string, there's no Riemann cube, but there's a certain uh, Chern -Simon, Lorentz Chern Simons term squared. Uh, this won't be very important. But what will be interesting for us is that at alpha prime cubed, all, uh, all the string theories, bosonic, heterotic, or type two, have uh, a Riemann to the fourth correction. Uh, some of them have more than one, but in particular, they all have a Riemann to the fourth correction with this interesting coefficient in front, it's theta of three. Right? That will be important for us. Now the question is, can we write also these alpha prime corrections in an ODD invariant way? Uh, and right, right off the bat, there's a reason to be skeptical because it turns out that uh, in double field theory, there's no analog of the Riemann tensor, okay? You can't, there's no ODD invariant version of the Riemann tensor as was shown by Holm and Zwieback in 2012. So then you're already in trouble because you see that all these corrections start with some power of the Riemann tensor. But if you have no generalization of the Riemann tensor to the ODD covariant formalism, how are you going to write these in an ODD invariant way? But remarkably, despite this, uh, uh, it seems like a very big obstacle. Marcus and Nunez were able to cast the first alpha prime correction, so the, the Riemann squared terms for the bosonic and the heterotic string in an ODD invariant form in this paper in 2015. So they were working in a frame-like formulation uh, of double field theory, where you work instead of a generalized metric, you work with a generalized field bind. Uh, so I will denote it by capital E, and it has this capital doubled indices. And it transforms in the following way. So the M index transforms as before uh, under ODD, the OSM element of ODD, the constant element of ODD. Uh, while, uh, uh, but now it also transforms under local double Lorentz transformations, because these indices are double with this parameter lambda. Uh, and this uh, lambda now takes a block diagonal form. So it has the components lambda plus and lambda minus, uh, which gives two, the two copies of the Lorentz group. Okay, so you're doubling, because you're doubling these uh, tangent space indices, you have to double the Lorentz group as well. And they show that there's a certain way that you can correct these double Lorentz transformations by adding an alpha prime correction. Uh, so this is the lowest order transformation with these other parameters. This lambda hat depends now on the fields and on the parameters lambda themselves. And it takes a specific form that I won't discuss here. But there are certain terms that you can add here so that you induce precisely the known Riemann squared uh, 
terms that occur at order alpha prime and the effective action for ribosomic in the heteroids. So uh, this is possible because this lambda hat, it turns out that it depends on two parameters. And if you set, call them A and B, and if you set them equal, you get the bosonic string result. And if you set one of them to zero, you get the heterotic string result. Uh, in fact, this correction to the transformations, uh, if you look at the heterotic string, it reproduces precisely uh, the correction to the transformation of the B field, which is implied by the modified uh, Bianchi identity for uh, for H in the heterotic string. So it's well known that uh, in the heterotic string, uh, instead of DH being zero, you have DH uh, has a uh, is proportional to alpha prime trace R, which R plus a term that involves the the gauge fields, which I'm setting to zero here. This implies a, a correction. This means that B transforms in a complicated way under Lorentz transformations, and that's precisely captured by this correction uh, of the double field theory, uh, double Lorentz transformations. Uh, but that's not all, because once you add this alpha prime correction here, uh, these transformations close at the lowest order as they have to for consistency, but they don't close to higher orders in alpha prime. So that requires that you have to add you have to keep adding higher alpha prime corrections here, and this would require you to add an infinite series of alpha prime corrections. Uh, and in fact, uh, the result has been worked out. Uh, the terms that you that you have to add at order alpha prime squared have been found, uh, and uh, this was discussed in, in these two papers. The first is for the heterotic string, and the second for the bosonic string. Uh, and they have they have the structure. They have the right structure that they could potentially account for also the uh, the the order alpha prime squared correction to the bosonic and heterotic string, which is given here. Riemann cubed for the bosonic and Schoenstein squared for the heterotic. Okay, but okay. So so far so good. We seem to be able to account in double field theory for the first two alpha prime corrections. But what about the third one? Well, clearly, this cannot account for the correction that we had at order alpha prime cube because it had a coefficient uh, state of three. So remember, we had state of three times Riemann to the fourth. And by completing these transformations, to adding terms and completing it to higher order to an alpha prime, you can never generate the state of three. So the question is then, is it possible to account for these terms the state of three, uh, in double field theory? And this is the question we wanted to address. And to address it, we set up a systematic way uh, to find ODD invariance by working order by order in the fields. In fact, like Marcus and Nunez, we work in a formulation where ODD symmetry is actually manifest. So it's built into the formalism. And the problem is actually to construct uh, things that are invariant under the double Lorentz transformations. So that's the, the non-trivial question to construct invariance under these double Lorentz transformations, possibly corrected by, by alpha prime corrections. Uh, so Sorry, can I ask something? Uh, yes. So you discussed just the results of Nunez and Marquez. Mm -hmm. So do you understand correctly that they, their construction is not some kind of a manifest standard construction that, that once you have this E that transforms this way allows you to construct invariance. So just they just made, uh, let's say the most general ansatz and just constructed everything that works, right? Uh, they uh, they made uh, they came up with this correction to the. But even uh, with, without correction, is it clear how to construct an action that uh, uh, enjoys these sym these symmetries? No, no. I, we'll discuss exactly. Oh, okay. We'll discuss that, but it, it's not at all clear how you do it. So what they did was to come up with this correction uh, by. Well, they started from the heterotic string and saw that you have to correct the field transformation somehow. They generalized that to the double formulation, and they saw that actually that reproduces precisely the terms that you need at order alpha prime. Mm -hmm. So they work kind of backwards compared to what we want to do. Linus? Yeah. Yes. I also have a question. So I understand why in heterotic string you can worry about uh, field binds, but in bosonic mm -hmm. string, why on earth you need to use this field bind formulation? Why it's not 
enough to stay with metric and whatever. Uh, it's not clear to me that you need to use it. I think you can reformulate things in terms of the generalized metric if you want. Okay. But uh, it's it's sort of natural to use this formulation. It, but you could try to do everything instead in the metric formulation. Uh, yeah. We didn't try that, but I suspect that that should work also. So I don't think you have to introduce the generalized field lines. But for us, it was convenient. And also because they worked in that formalism, it's easier to, to compare. Uh, and also the, the symmetries are different. But so in our case, what we were correcting is the double Lorentz transformation, whereas the other case, you have to correct the ODD transformations themselves. So it's a little bit different, but it, it, it should be possible to work also in that, uh, in that setting. Uh, so the formulation that we use uh, is, is often called the flux formulation of double field theory. It's due to these guys. Um, so as we said, you, you start from a generalization, from a generalized field bind, so a double field bind, and it's parameterized in the following way. So it involves this uh, E plus and E minus, which are ordinary field binds for the metric, for the usual metric G, and then B is appearing here also. It's just the, the B field. Uh, and the reason you have two field binds, E plus and E minus, is that you have two copies of the Lorentz group. So uh, the Lorentz group rotates independently. So remember, the, the, Lore, the double Lorentz transformation had two components, a lambda plus and lambda minus, and these uh, rotate independently, the E plus and E minus field binds. And then you have two constants, met, the constant metrics now. You have the ODD metric that we had before. Uh, so in uh, uh, with MN indices, it was off diagonal, it had just once off the diagonal. But now if you convert it to these A and B indices with the generalized field line, it becomes diagonal. It's just the Minkowski metric and minus the Minkowski metric in the diagonal box, the, the usual D-dimensional Minkowski metric. And then you have the generalized metric, which before was written in terms of G and B and so on, but now of course, the point of this generalized field binds is that you convert that into something simple, namely just the, the, the Minkowski metric in this diagonal box. Okay, so we have, we have now two constant metrics. And in fact, uh, but it's easy to see that they square to one. And so you can build uh, projection operators from these. So you take, uh, you take this a dot plus or minus h times one half, and that gives you a projection operator. Clearly, if you take plus, uh, this component cancels against that, so you're just projecting on the on the upper uh, block. And if you take minus, you, you're projecting with a minus sign on the lower block. Uh, and these constant projection operators means that you can canonically split the doubled index A into uh, the plus projected or minus projected indices, which I will call uh, underlined and overlined indices. Okay, so the, the point is that this doubled index has a canonical split into two d-dimensional indices. Uh, now, just as the ordinary field bind transforms both under diffeomorphisms and uh, local Lorentz transformations, this generalized field bind that we introduced, uh, as we said, transforms both under generalized diffeomorphisms, which are the usual diffeomorphisms of the metric together with the gauge transformations of the B field, and it also transforms under the double Lorentz transformations. And this makes the field bind awkward to work with the, directly. But um, we know that in the usual uh, case of Riemannian geometry, we can construct the spin connection. Uh, and if I, uh, if I construct the components uh, with the tangent space indices in this way, uh, and, and obviously this is constructed from the derivatives of the, from the, derivative of the field bind, uh, these components will only transform under the local Lorentz transformations and the, the scalars under the diffeomorphisms. And so the doubled analog of this would be to construct a generalized diffeomorphism scalar from the derivatives of uh, the generalized field bind. And it's actually not hard to show that there's only one, uh, there's only one such object. Uh, so you have to take the derivative uh, of the field bind and contract it. So I'm defining this DA derivative to be the, the generalized field bind contracted with the usual 
coordinate derivative. So you take the derivative of the generalized field bind and you contract this M index with another generalized field bind. And then you have to anti-symmetrize in the indices A, B, and C. Okay, so we call that object F. So it's anti-symmetric in the indices A, B, and C. That's the only scalar that, that uh, generalized diffeomorphism scalar that you can construct. So that's the analog of this, this components of the spin connection. But if we take the generalized diliton into account, we can construct one more generalized diffeomorphism scalar with one index. And it's just uh, essentially the derivative uh, of the generalized diliton with decorated with this extra piece involving the generalized field line. Okay, and this FABC and FA are known as the generalized fluxes. Uh, but all they are are the analogs of the components of the spin connection in the usual Riemannian case and just the, the derivative uh, with the tangent space index, uh, where I convert the coordinate index to tangent space of the, of the dilaton. Uh, and generalized diffeomorphism invariance now requires that the action is constructed from these generalized fluxes FA. Uh, and together with their uh, flat derivatives, so derivatives with this A index, uh, so converted with the generalized field line. Uh, so now it looks like we have just two fields, but as we saw, we can split the index A into uh, overlined and underlined indices. So this F can be split into two fields, uh, F A overlined and F A underlined. And similarly, this guy with three indices can be split, split into four. So you can have all indices overlined, one underlined and two overlined, one overlined and two underlined, or all underlined. So we actually have six fields. Um, uh, now, ODD symmetry, as well as generalized diffeomorphisms, is manifest because we constructed these to be generalized diffeomorphism scalars. And ODD symmetry is manifest because this M index is contracted here. And uh, rotating it by a constant ODD matrix uh, does nothing to these fluxes. Okay, so those two symmetries are manifest, but uh, the price we pay is that the double Lorentz uh, transformations now transform these fields in a rather complicated way. So the transformations are given here for three of the fields. So if I take this F uh, with three indices projected in the same way, uh, it transforms by uh, anti-symmetrized derivative with this lambda plus some uh, uh, rotation of the this lambda rotating the, the indices. Whereas if you take this f with one underlined and two overlined indices, it just transforms as derivative of lambda plus again this rotation terms. And for f a with one index, it transforms sort of like this divergence of lambda. Uh, and so here I just wrote three of the fields with mostly the ones with mostly overlined indices, but you can just reverse all the projections and you have the same uh, expressions for those. Uh, the, the, this lambda with overlined indices corresponds to the lambda plus I had before, and then this lambda with underlined indices which correspond to the lambda minus. So these are the two, uh, the parameters of the two Lorentz uh, factors, the double Lorentz group. And this lambda has no component with mixed indices, so overlined, uh, one overlined and one underlined index, because it's uh, block diagonal. Um, so if you look at these transformations, it looks like this FABC with overlined indices transforms like a three form, roughly. It's not exactly true because there's some uh, weird projection involved here. Uh, and it looks like this F with the uh, one overlined and two, one underlined and two overlined indices transforms like a connection. If you just look at the first, it just looks like D lambda with no anti symmetrization. Uh, but we're interested in writing invariant actions now. And to do that, we would normally first construct the covariant field strengths, for example, the Riemann tensor from the spin connection. Uh, and once we have the covariant field strength, you can easily construct invariant actions. But this approach fails here. Uh, and it turns out that this F, uh, this flux with three indices, has no independent covariant field strengths. This is related to this comment I had before that there's no analog of the Riemann tensor uh, 
double here. So for example, if you tried, if you, if you take this guy like uh, transformed like a three form, uh, where all indices have the same projection, okay, this is some three index antisymmetric object, and you try to construct its field strength by taking a derivative and antisymmetrizing, then because F itself is constructed from the derivative of the generalized field bind, there's a Bianchi identity that says that this is just proportional to F times F again. So this is not an independent object. Now, if you take the other guy, which looked like it transformed like a similar to a connection, from that you can construct an independent object that looks sort of like the Riemann tensor. So um, maybe I need to define it in this way. So I call it R because it's turns out to be similar to the Riemann tensor. It has two overline and two underline indices. So you just take a, uh, well, I'm doing the, the opposite project of F, but it doesn't matter. You take a DA with an overlined index, uh, F, uh, B with an overlined index and anti-symmetrize. Uh, and then it's convenient to add these extra two terms there. If you define it in that way. Uh, excuse me, could, could, could you yeah. please clarify what what what's the problem is that you can't find invariance of this gauge transformation which transform as you like or you can't find invariance at all because in principle you can ask a question you have these f's you have transformation law and you can mm -hmm. ask for local functionals which are invariant under the uh, diffeomorphisms and the Lorentz, right yeah, well, even, even if it does not look geometrical, it, it probably just means that you are in different geometry or in different uh, parameterization. But but still, you 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 should be able to solve this issue, right? What are what are your physical objects? What are your invariants? Yeah, Is it... I mean, the, essentially, that's what we're trying to do here. I'm just saying mm -hmm. here. I'm just making the point that if I try to construct the field strength that I would like, I would normally do that doesn't that doesn't work. I can't. Con well, at least in this way, I'm not proving it here, but it seems like, and you can prove it, uh, that you can't construct any invariant field strengths, or covariantly you, transforming field strengths. Uh, you can't construct any invariant field strengths? Co covariant, yeah, that are independent objects. You see, if, if you try to take the anti-symmetrized derivative of this guy, you just get something that's f times f again, so it's not an independent object because of Bianchi identities. Okay, thanks anyway. It's okay. I think. So, but this, this object you can construct and it turns out you could do, you can construct the object where you reverse the, the projections also, but because of Bianchi identities that's not independent, it's actually minus. Now, this thing uh, transforms almost like you want. So under double Lorentz transformations, it transforms in the following way. So there's a rotation by this uh, lambda that parameter of the double Lorentz transformations, just like, like you would have for the uh, for a covariant object. But then it also has these two terms. So very roughly, this is like the spin connection times D of lambda. Okay? Uh, and those two terms mean that you don't have a, uh, this object's not transforming covariantly. Uh, but, uh, Let's note that this RABC is invariant if we just restrict the leading order in fields, because there's no term here that's, that, has, that has just lambda. These also involve the, the field path. Okay? There's nothing with, the, say, two derivatives of lambda. So if you just work the leading order in fields, then R is invariant. So in that sense, it's kind of it's the closest analog that we can have of a Riemann tensor. Uh, now, given this lack of field strengths, how do we construct invariants? Okay, this is not something that we're normally faced with, uh, but actually uh, you can use a, an interesting approach, which uh, actually goes a long way back. It's uh, discussed in this paper by Utiyama from 56. Let me just explain briefly how that works for the very simplest example that you can consider. So suppose you have a Hue one gauge field with this usual transformation of lambda some arbitrary function. But let's assume that we don't know anything about connections or field strengths or anything. And we want to construct an action that's invariant under this transformation. So we take some general Lagrangian that depends on A, its derivative, the second derivative, and so on, any number of derivatives that we want. And then we require that L is invariant 
under this gauge transformation. So sending A to A plus B lambda. Now that condition becomes, uh, so you have a term from varying A, you have a term from varying derivative of A and so on. So the condition looks like this, uh, the corresponding number of derivatives of lambda. But now you notice that lambda is supposed to be an arbitrary function. So that means that all its derivatives are independent. And because each term in this sum has a different number of derivatives of lambda, each term must be separately set to zero. So you should require now each term in the sum to be zero. So this should be zero for n uh, being one, two, and so on, up to the number of derivatives that you want to include in the action. Uh, now, if you write out explicitly what that means, the first condition is just uh, when n is one, you have no derivative on A here, so that just says that uh, the Lagrangian has to be independent of A itself, okay? The next condition becomes uh, the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the symmetrized derivative of A has to be zero. So the symmetrization here is in, imposed by the derivatives here. So here you have a number of derivatives, it's obviously symmetric in mu one to mu n, so that imposes a symmetry here. Uh, Excuse me, can I add something? Yes. Uh, uh, so you obviously missed Chern Simon's turn. And uh, yes. coming back to the previous discussion, you don't want maybe a Riemann tensor. You want action to be gauge invariant up to total derivative, which well may uh, imply that there is no Riemann tensor. So no, uh, well here I'm not so. Yes, I'm ignoring. Uh, I'm ignoring Chern Simon's terms here. I mean, you can obviously you can adapt this to include also chern simons terms, but I will be ignoring chern simons terms. It's an interesting okay, question whether you can write chern simons terms, but it's not it's not relevant for, I think, for, for what we're trying yeah, but, to do. But, but it, be, it becomes much less trivial, this problem. By the way, what you are doing is almost the standard technique for, compu <laughs> for computing uh, gauge invariant objects in the field theory, this uh, bialystic homology, and if you allow for total derivative, it's this local bialystic homology, which is much more difficult because you cover, as Jane mentioned, this uh, Chern Simons type objects, and they are much less trivial. In uh, Yes, it is less event. trivial, but I don't expect it to be so relevant for the the question that I'm interested in, which is whether you can construct this R to the fourth. Term. Could be, could be. Because they should not transform with the total derivatives. They're not Chern Simons. I mean, you expect Chern Simons terms to involve you know, the epsilon symbol. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I don't expect it to be relevant for the discussion here. But for the moment, let me just ignore them because as you said, it becomes much more complicated. Okay, so what you find is that L has to be independent of the symmetrized derivative and so on. Uh, you know, L has to be independent of uh, two derivatives on A all symmetrized. And so uh, what that means is that L can depend only on the anti-symmetrized derivative uh, of A, which is the field strength, or derivatives of that. Okay, so we recovered a well-known fact. Linus, uh, yes. just to elaborate on this Jim Simon's remark. So yeah. the uh, important assumption here is locality. Uh, yes, of course, I'm assuming locality. Yes, yeah, so that may be a loophole that you may not have a local action which has the required property. Sure, but yeah, I, I don't even know how to analyze the question in, in that case. Uh, yes, I'm assuming that there's a local. It's kind of related to Chern Simons. Yeah, it's related to Chern Simons or Vesumino terms or something. Yeah, yeah maybe. Uh, so the, the same approach can be applied also to Young Mills theory and gravity, which was discussed by Utiama. Uh, but uh, we know the answers in those cases, but here we can apply this idea to try to construct ODD invariants because we, we don't know of any invariant field strengths, but that doesn't stop us from using this method. But actually, the problem is a bit complicated, and to simplify it even more, we will work order by order in fields. Uh, so that simplifies the problem a lot because uh, to leading order, for example, the transformations of the fields that we have are just, just have this D lambda pieces. Uh, so for f with all indices projected in the same way, it's just an anti-symmetrized derivative of lambda, and then we have, uh, you know, this guy transforms just with the derivative of lambda that transforms some convergence of lambda. 
And similarly for the fields with the projections uh, projected in the opposite way. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll take some, uh, so we start from some, we take the action to be, uh, to have this e to the minus 2d, which you think of as part of the measure, and then a Lagrangian, uh, which is nth order in fields. So that's what this n indicates here. And then it's built out of this generalized fluxes and their derivatives. Uh, okay, and we start uh, with the term of n or nth order, and then we have to add, you know, nth plus one, uh, nth plus two order, and so on. Um, now, double in, uh, Lorentz invariance requires to leading order that the variation of this uh, nth order Lagrangian is of order n in the fields and, and higher. Uh, and if you analyze this condition now in the same way that using the same uh, Utiyama approach, then you find that uh, this leading order Lagrangian has to be constructed from the following combinations of the fields. Uh, this R that we had before, really we're just working to leading order, so we, we just see the leading piece, the anti-symmetric derivative of that F. Uh, or uh, this divergence of F with one index, or the derivative of F with one index where the projection on the derivative and on F is opposite, plus this piece, okay? Or this uh, F uh, ABC projected in the same way, where each index is contracted with the derivative. Now this can, these phi one, two, three are arbitrary combinations of fields. Uh, but you have three derivatives that are uh, contracted with an F, plus F with mixed projections also contracted with three derivatives and anti-symmetric in this way. Uh, so it has to be built out of this uh, and their derivatives okay? to uh, have the, uh, to be invariant under double Lorentz transformations at leading order. Uh, and now we want to go on from that to, uh, to the subleading order. And the first thing we'll do is to construct the two derivative action because that, that will be important. Uh, so if you look at if you look at these objects, there's only one scalar in this list. There's only one scalar of dimension two that you can build. In fact, it's this guy. It's the only thing that has all the indices contracted and it's of dimension two. So we have to start from that guy and then we can add things quadratic in the field. Okay? This is obviously linear in, in the fields. And we add things quadratic in the field and, by and we fix them by requiring that this should be invariant up to total derivatives. Uh, so now we have to allow for total derivatives uh, to the to the next order, and that fixes completely these quadratic terms to take this form. Uh, and then you could go on to high, to add more terms, but here it truncates because uh, these fields have dimension one, and we're constructing a dimension two action, so you can't add anything with the three terms. Uh, and this coincides with the with the Lagrangian uh, for double field theory in the flux formulation. So if you work out what this gives you, it gives you precisely the, the leading Poissonic string effective action that we started with of an SNS sector of the super string. Uh, when you plug in what the form for the generalized field line. Okay, so that's the, the leading two derivative action. And now we can go on to consider higher derivative invariance at the subleading order. So we know that at the leading order, as we said, they must be built from one of these four, it must be built out of these four objects. But now you notice that B and C actually turn, turn out to be proportional to the lowest order, the leading term in the lowest order equations of motion. So it means that these guys can be removed by a field redefinition. That's their, proportional to the equations of motion. Finally, this last guy, this kind of weird looking thing, uh, only arises at dimension 10, which is the uh, corresponds to alpha prime to the fourth or higher. Uh, so how do you see that? Well, that's because these phi's themselves have to be built out of, the, out of these invariant fields. And so if you take them to be R, for example, that has dimension two, so they have two, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So that's dimension 10. So if we're only interested in, uh, uh, invariance up to alpha prime cubed. And remember alpha prime cubed is where the R to the fourth terms come in and those are what we're mainly interested in. Uh, 
uh, then we can forget also about this guy. Okay, so that means that at the leading order, we can uh, we have to build the Lagrangian out of R or its derivatives, uh, and that up to order alpha prime cube means that you can have R squared, R cubed, or R to the fourth, or you can have derivatives. You can have two derivatives of R squared, four derivatives of R squared, or two derivatives of R cubed. All the structures you can have. But actually, you can show that the terms with derivatives of R can again be removed by the fielder definitions. Okay, so I don't have to consider them. And therefore, all I need to consider is the these powers of R at the leading order. So R squared, R cubed, or R to the fourth. And then I have to add subleading terms uh, and see what the conditions are for the action to be invariant. Uh, at the next order, which means its transformation is of order f plus one, f, f to the power m plus one in, in fields, plus, of course, total derivative terms. Okay, uh, of course, there are lots of conditions, but we will look only at a subset of the conditions, which will turn out to be enough for our purposes, and we will only look at the terms in the variation of the Lagrangian, which are proportional to one derivative uh, of this lambda with two overlined indices, okay? So the derivative can have an overlined or an underlined index. So that will give us two conditions and those will be enough for our purposes. So before I write them, I need to define the derivatives of this Lagrangian with respect to the fields. So for the leading term, uh, which is R squared R cubed or R to the fourth, I define the variation of that term with respect to R CD as the as this G A B C D. And then I define these other guys to be the variation of this subleading L M plus one, which is of order N plus one in the Fs. Uh, I define these G's to be the very the derivative uh, of that with respect to the field. So F A B C uh, this guy with mixed projections or the one with one index. Uh, only these three fields enter here because I'm only looking at the uh, one copy of the Lorentz group, so the lambda with overlined indices, and the other three fields don't transform under that. And then you can show that the conditions that you get take this form so that there's uh, two conditions. Uh, there's this one and this one. Uh, so they involve, remember this guy was the, the derivative of L with respect to the, with respect to R, and then these uh, with the derivatives of the derivative of the subleading terms with respect to the Fs. The new thing here is this H, uh, and that's needed because there's some freedom, because of the section condition, there's some freedom, freedom. if it happens that, that this derivative, uh, DC, is contracted with another derivative, then these two terms will not be independent. So to account for that freedom, I have to introduce this H, uh, which is built out of uh, some arbitrary, it can contain arbitrary um, expressions in the fields, but uh, it's defined to have the C index, the last index sitting on the derivative, okay? So whether it's overlined or underlined, it's defined in the same way. Okay, and that's to account for the freedom from the section condition. Then you notice that I have these dots on the right-hand side, and that denotes terms that I'm dropping. Uh, so that consists of total derivative terms, but then I will also be dropping some additional terms uh, because uh, it, will simplify, it will simplify my life. I will drop all terms which involve this F with one index and all terms which involve a divergence of F so a derivative uh, contracting one index, the F with three indices. Uh, now that's consistent to do. It's consistent with the Bianchi identities. Actually, it's slightly stronger than imposing the field equations. Uh, okay, so we'll, we will neglect all these terms uh, because it simplifies things. And another advantage of this is that uh, these terms include terms that come from modifying the double Lorentz transformation. So if I I know that in general, I would have to add alpha prime corrections to the double Lorentz transformations, but that will produce terms that involve this FA or, or this combination. And I can neglect those terms. So I don't have to worry about the, the modification of the double Lorentz transformations for what I want to say. Okay, so we start with the first, uh, which are R squared, 
invariance of the form R squared. So there's only one term I can write, R A B C D times R A B C D. And then I have to add terms cubic in the fields to that and ask that it's invariant uh, to the subleading order under double Lorentz transformations. And the two conditions that we have before, uh, now take this form. So the variation of this piece, the derivative of this piece with respect to R is just a single R. Um, so I'll plug that in there. And now you notice that if you symmetrize this first condition in the B and C index, say, uh, then this term drops out because it's by definition anti-symmetric in the A, B, and C index because it's the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to F, A, B, C, which is completely anti-symmetric. Okay, so that piece drops out. And this guy and this guy have a very constrained structure. So that means that this will impose in general a constraint on this first term, which means a constraint on the R squared term itself. Uh, but it turns out that it's satisfied in this case. Uh, so we don't have to worry about that. And we can solve these two conditions in the following way. So you just find uh, the first condition determines this GABC and HABC with all overlined indices to be the following. Uh, it's more or less clear, plus uh, and on the terms that we're neglecting. Uh, and then this condition determines these to have, uh, have this form at opposite sign. Uh, but now you notice the kind of curious thing here that this GABC with overlined indices depends on F uh, with mixed uh, one overline and two underlined indices indicated here. But uh, G, uh, G with mixed projections here does not depend on F with all overlined indices. But that might seem worrying because uh, it seems to be in conflict with the integrability condition that follows from the fact that this G is just a derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to F A, A B C. And if you, take if you take a derivative of that, you have just two derivatives of L with respect to F. And that has to be symmetric, right? Two derivatives are symmetric. And so that implies this integrability condition. But as we said, this doesn't depend on, uh, on this guy. So the right-hand side is zero. And in the present case, that gives us this condition. Basically that, okay, because this term, this was this, and if I take the derivative with respect to that guy, I'm just left with the R. Okay, so that means that R just has to be uh, if equal to the terms that we dropped. But this is actually satisfied here because the leading order, R itself is a total derivative and total derivatives are among the terms that we're dropping. So there's actually not a, a conflict with, uh, with this integrability condition. So, and in fact, you can go back and include all the terms that have been neglected and you've reproduced the result of Marcus and Nunez after a bit of work. Uh, but the advantage is that you also reproduce the correction to the double Lorentz transformation that they took as input. So basically this demonstrate that there, demonstrates that there, what they find is unique. There's no other way to correct the Lorentz transformation in the uh, R to the squared, in R, R squared invariant. Um, so now, uh, I'm almost out of time, I see, so I have to speed up here. But um, if you repeat this calculation for the R cubed terms, again, only one term that you can write, you find that it fails directly already in the first step. So this condition that you find, uh, when I take the first condition and symmetrize in B and C, that can't be satisfied in my case. And you conclude from that that there are no uh, R cubed, ODD invariant R cubed terms. However, Riemann cube terms will be generated at higher order from the R squared by completion of the R squared terms, but that's a different. Here we're just showing that there's no independent invariant of the, uh, of the R cubed form. But that was not checked that you get R cubed term. Uh, no, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. They derived the terms, but they didn't. Uh, they didn't simplify them and compare to, they didn't go down to a, a usual supergravity description. They're just written in a double language, a very long expressions. But that would be quite remarkable if they, if that procedure could reproduce R cube, which is present in bosonic string, because naively R squared and R cube, they are sort of independent. Well, they come from the same three point function for, for graviton, but. Yeah. It, it would be really a, a kind of string theory test. 
that this procedure makes sense? I think that will work, but, the, but that's kind of a, a separate story and it requires a little bit of, of work to, to simplify the expressions. Uh, but let me go on now to the, to the, or to the fourth terms, which are the most interesting. So now there are eight possible structures in the written here, eight possible contractions of four uh, of these R's. So we add them together with some arbitrary coefficients, and then we have to find the, uh, we want to find the terms of fifth order in the field so that this is invariant to the subleading order. Now, if you symmetrize the first condition that we had in B and C, it takes this form. And now it turns out remarkably to have a unique solution uh, with all these coefficients C1 to C8 uh, non-zero, a unique non-trivial solution. And the solution takes this form. So you can write it uh, in, this, uh, in this notation uh, where you define this T8 tensor in the following way. Uh, if you contract it with four anti-symmetric matrices, M1 to M4, uh, then it, uh, it takes this form. So it's a trace of four of them and the trace of products of them, and then the cyclically permuted in two, three, and four. And you define a similar guy with underlined indices. Remarkably, this is precisely the right structure to match the alpha prime cube correction uh, in string theory, which was first found by Gross and Witten doing uh, amplitude calculations, and then also derived from beta function calculations by, by other people. Uh, and so that correction looks as follows, is T8, T8 over the fourth plus this piece. But actually the second piece at the leading order in fields, so four fields, the second term is the total derivative. So it's not surprising that we're not seeing that here because we're working with that uh, fourth order in field. We're reproducing the size of this leading term. Uh, and now from this condition, uh, from the first condition that we have, we read off again this GABC, uh, this anti-symmetric guy. Uh, it has this T8 guy contracted with an F with mixed indices and this object K, which is just uh, DF cubed roughly with the structure of indices, which is not very important. But again, now we can again look at the integrability condition because we saw for R squared, there was a potential uh, problem with the integrability condition, which was not actually there in that case, but it was non-obvious non that it wasn't there. Uh, now the integrability condition says that this guy, uh, again, it has to be a total derivative, but if you work it out from this expression, so you're just taking the derivative of this G with respect to F, and you just find this K, so this T8 times this K, and you find that that has to be a total derivative for the integrability condition to be satisfied. But it's easy to show that this K uh, in here is not a total derivative. Okay. So therefore, in this case, the integrability condition is not satisfied. And you conclude that the R to the fourth term cannot be completed with terms of fifth order in fields to uh, an ODD invariant object, because it's not possible to satisfy the integrability condition. Okay, I think I'm out of time, but let me just state my conclusions. So I've tried to argue that double field theory in flux formulation admits a Riemann square correction, which was known already in the literature, but we show that it was unique, but it seems not to admit any Riemann cube or Riemann to the fourth uh, correction. And this suggests that double field theory cannot account for this, uh, uh, these terms, uh, theta three times Riemann to the fourth that are known to be present at all their alpha prime cubed in all string theories. In fact. At least, unless you somehow modify the double field theory uh, uh, approach in some drastic way. Uh, but note that while we've shown that there's no ODD where D is 26 or 10 uh, invariant, clearly we know that if you dimensionally reduce the theory it, on D on a D-dimensional torus, then you must have the ODD symmetry where D is the dimension of that torus. And indeed, this was verified for the, for the maximal reduction when you reduce on a nine torus and you just have the, the time direction left in a recent paper by Corina Holm and Marcus. So that's, uh, that's perfectly fine and that's consistent with what we know. Uh, now, let me end just with, the, with two interesting questions I think that this raises. Uh, 
One is, can we, can we find a more geometric or invariant characterization of this problem that we find? Because it's not, it's not so transparent in the way we're doing the calculation, why uh, we're finding this obstruction. Perhaps there's some more geometric characterization of it if you use some you know, more sophisticated tools like Finetti algebras and stuff that people have been playing around with. The other question is, let's assume that this ODD symmetry is broken for these higher alpha prime corrections. Can we still exploit it? Uh, maybe uh, just allowing for the fact that it's broken and adding you know, some, in some sense, small terms that are breaking it and still exploit the symmetry. That's another, I think, very interesting question. Uh, if we can still get some mileage and uh, uh, constrain the form of these higher alpha prime corrections. Okay, I'll end there. Apologies for going over time. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, can I ask a simple question regarding the dimensional dependent identities? Can it be that if uh, capital D is uh, big enough, you find nothing, but if it's small enough, you have some identities and uh, there is new invariant that appears? Uh, yeah. So. For double field theory, you would normally take capital D to be 26 or 10, but let's say let's say you wanted to relax that and take it to be smaller. Uh, in principle, if you took it small enough, uh, uh, our calculation would not apply anymore because there could be there are various symmetrizations in this indices. So, for example, if you look uh, if you look here, you're anti-symmetrizing in three overlined indices here. But if you're if you take it to be two dimensional, that would vanish automatically because of uh, just identities to to very low dimension. So yeah, you could evade it just by taking d very small. But I don't expect that you really evade it because we look just at uh, at a few terms and then you have to go back and look at the rest of the terms and see that you can really get around it uh, and still have something non-trivial, which I very much doubt. But you would have to take it to be like two or maybe three to, to evade the problem that we're trying. And that would not really help because what you want in double field theory, you, you need it to be big enough to account for the symmetry that you get under dimensional reduction. For example, you get in this case, uh, they show that you get an 099 symmetry. But then you to to have that manifest already in ten dimensions, you need to have at least O nine nine. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Is it possible that you are missing out some opportunities by trying to do uh, this frame uh, formulation? instead of metric one? Uh, well, so one thing I can say, so obviously we had to make some assumptions. So one of the things that we assumed that we already mentioned is that we neglected churn simons terms. So in principle, uh, there could perhaps be some loophole to not prove that, although I, I sort of doubt it. The other assumption that we made is that we can write the action in terms of the generalized flux themselves, okay? Uh, and, and not just in terms of the, I mean, you can try to write some arbitrary action in terms of the generalized field bind instead. That will give you more freedom. But then you also have more symmetries that you have to set, uh, that you have to make an invariant under because then you have the, the generalized diffeomorphisms that you have to account for. So we gave a proof that, we gave a proof which is not complete uh, that uh, if you require, if you write an action in terms of the generalized field line, and then you require the generalized diffeomorphism invariance of that, you find that you have to express things in terms of the generalized flux system. That, that proof is not complete because again, we dropped uh, total derivative terms there that in principle could have some effect. Although I, I suspect that they shouldn't be relevant. Uh, but yeah, so there are there are some assumptions that we made, and there 
in principle, some loopholes still to close. Right? Yeah. My personal feeling is that they they won't. Uh, I mean, it, it, I would be very surprised if you can get around this uh, using those loopholes. But of course, yeah. we had to make some assumptions. So there's still th things to, to check. I see. Any other questions? So uh, I have two uh, comments, minor comments. So one, it could be that like uh, with chiral scale as a type or cell dual forms, you don't have manifest symmetry, but somehow this ODD is not realized manifestly. Um, yeah, so, here yeah. In, this, in this formulation, what's not, we don't have manifest symmetry, right? But it's the double Lorentz transformation. Okay, yeah. That are not manifest. Of course, if you used, so you could try to repeat the same thing with the metric formulation, and then it will be the the ODD transformations that are not manifest. Yeah, yeah I, I guess I, I'm trying to think of, say, equations of motion being um, invariant, but action not, or something like that. Like yes, yeah, so that, that's, an, that's an important point. So what I showed here is that there's a conflict with the integrability condition. So that only means that you can't write an action. So you could hope then that you could write equations of motion. Okay. That's, that's right. I didn't show that you can't write equations of motion that have that invariance uh, so, for yeah. the R, R to the fourth term. Mm -hmm. I only show that you can't write an action. Yeah, so this is related to another point. So in usual uh, sort of string theory framework, we know that this effective action produces equations of motion, which are equivalent to conformal invariance conditions for yeah. sigma model, which right. is string propagation, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a big uh, sort of underlying reason why there is this agreement. Uh, now, one could hope that there is some kind of world sheet formulation for this for the doubled sigma model formulation. Right. Uh, for these doubled coordinates and then imposing, say, conformal invariance and Lorentz invariance conditions, mm -hmm. you get some conditions on the on the fields which come on the couplings which of these doubled doubled sigma model, mm -hmm. which would be sort of related to the equation of motion of this double field theory uh, in principle. So I mm -hmm. guess if we just take your result at face value that suggests that this there's this program probably has failed to be realized. I, uh, uh, it's yeah, it's still possible that you can write equations of motion. As I said, we didn't yeah. rule that out. So it would be interesting if you could write some, that would be like the beta function equations. You could write those in an ODD invariant or covariant way, but you could not lift that to an action. That would, that would be very interesting. It's not something I, I look at. Yeah, there are lots of um, sort of assumptions which one need to make uh, when yeah. when relating this this effective action to say beta functions. You are thinking of this effective action being actually the one which you get from scattering amplitude. So here, yeah. there is no there is no attempt to think of some scattering amplitudes in double space or anything like that. So no. yeah. Anyway, so this is yeah. This is just fantasy. Yeah, we're just trying to match. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's still something that should be, uh, that's a possible sort of loophole that you could write maybe equations of motion. I, mean, I, would, I would be surprised, but it's still possible. Okay, it seems that we don't have any further questions. So thank you very much uh, for a nice talk. And thank you everyone for coming. Uh, see you next time.